Uh, when I was in the New Age, uh, we would have said there's a lot of male energy in this room. I don't, I don't think I've ever spoken to a group that has this many guys, it's, but it's nice to be here. Um, I've been accused of seeing the New Age everywhere, and I thought it was kind of funny when I pulled into Temecula, the very first thing I saw was the Lady of the Lake New Age bookstore. And then I pulled into a parking lot, and I started talking to this guy that was at the day labor office here, and he told me he'd been having some problems. And I said, with work? He says, yeah, but he says, I've been having a lot of spirits at night that I have to deal with. So uh, I guess that was the beginning of my introduction to, to being here. Keith Green, the uh, late singer, songwriter, brother, uh, wrote a song called Satan's Boast, No One Believes in Me Anymore. Just a couple of verses from that. He said, well, I used, in, in regards to the devil singing this, well, I used to have to sneak around, but now they just open their doors. No one's watching for my tricks since no one believes in me anymore. I'm gaining power by the hour. They're falling by the score. You know, it's getting very simple now since no one believes in me anymore. Yet we read in Ephesians 6, 10 to 13, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. I contend that part of our armor is not being ignorant of Satan's devices. 2 Corinthians 2.11, lest Satan get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. I think, you know, in the book of Matthew, when it says, while men slept, the enemy came and sowed tares. That's what's kind of happened. A lot of people think that the New Age was something that happened back with Shirley MacLaine. That is exactly what the devil wants you to think of the New Age. It's just Shirley MacLaine running down the beach with crystals or whatever, saying, I am God. I remember at that time, uh, David Letterman uh, and others late at night were making jokes about it. But she accomplished a very specific task, which was to introduce the New Age. And there were a lot of introductions that were made in the 80s, but it's never stopped. It's, it's just become bigger and bigger. But they are no longer referring to themselves as the New Age. I'm sure a lot of you here remember some of the books that were written back, particularly in the 80s, early 90s, that exposed the New Age. There was a lot of talk about the New Age. So the New Age definitely wanted to a, a, attain a more of a postmodern kind of status. So they're now referring to themselves as the new spirituality. The new spirituality. Interestingly, Brian McLaren and many of the emerging church leaders are now not really comfortable with the word Christianity and they're calling what they're doing the new spirituality. And interestingly, a lot of the stuff there dovetails. Matthew 24 has been relegated to the first century. Um, prophecy is pretty much out the window. I don't really understand how they call themselves evangelicals. I, I don't really, I know that one of them said that Brian McLaren's status culminated with his being pronounced one of the top 25 evangelicals by Time Magazine. I thought that was pretty telling that Time Magazine is the one telling us who evangelicals are and how, how, they, sh how they should get their status in, in the church. Ephesians 5, 12 to 13, the Apostle Paul said, it's a shame to even speak of the unfruitful works of darkness, but we must. All things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. About a month ago, I received this in the mail. It was part of a message that was given by Dr. Harry Ironside, who was the pastor from at Moody Memorial Church from 1930 to 1948. And I thought it was pretty interesting because I was sort of thinking about you know, what I wanted to say here, what the Lord wanted me to say, and I, I kind of thought maybe the Lord had this sent to me because, again, I didn't even know this person. It's a little bit lengthy, but I think it's worth reading. Here's what Dr. Ironside said. Objection is often raised, even by some sound in the faith, regarding the exposure of error as being entirely negative and of no real edification. Of late, the hue and cry has been against any and all negative teaching. But the brethren who assume this attitude forget that a large part of the New Testament, both of the teaching of our blessed Lord himself and the writings of the apostles, is made up of this very character of ministry. 
namely showing the satanic origin and therefore the unsettling results of the propagation of erroneous systems which Peter in his second epistle so definitely refers to as damnable heresies. Our Lord prophesied, many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Within our own day, how many false prophets have risen and oh, how many are the deceived? This is back in his time. I know this, that after my departing, grievous wolves shall enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch. Ironside then writes, my own observation is that these grievous wolves alone and in packs are not sparing even the most favored flocks. Under shepherds in these perilous times will do well to note the apostle's warning. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. It is as important in these days as in Paul's. In fact, it is increasingly important to expose the many types of false teaching that on every hand abound more and more. We are called upon to contend earnestly for the faith once for all delivered to the saints while we hold the truth in love. The faith means the whole body of revealed truth and to contend for all of God's truth necessitates some negative teaching. I came into the faith because someone, Johanna Michelson, cared enough and was led by the Lord to write a book warning about the deep, dark deception that's behind a lot of what's calling itself the alternative spirituality that's out there in the world. I was saved out of the New Age movement in 1984. I had been involved for about five years actively before that, as many who got in, have gotten involved with the New Age were into self-help, personal growth. That, you know, Wayne Dyer started off with just some real simple books on self-help, and now he's you know, condoning demons that are speaking through uh, Esther Hicks and calling it this collective group calls itself the source or Abraham. These are all becoming kind of like part of our vocabulary. I remember when I first came into the faith, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Will Barron, who had come out of the New Age, uh, said that in England, where he was from, all this stuff was rampant. But at that stage, you know, back in the mid 80s, it was just sort of working its way in through people like Shirley MacLaine and M. Scott Peck, and then eventually the, the, the huge force of Oprah Winfrey. But uh, we're now there. We're, we're where things are just exploding all around us, and there's so many things happening that sometimes it's hard to keep track of it. As pastors, you can't, you can't be reading all this stuff, and you don't want to read this stuff. But there are books that have been written by some of us that have been led to do it. Uh, Ray Youngin's book, A Time of Departing, is a great book on contemplative prayer and the dangers of contemplative prayer. Just opening yourself up to hear what God says with no warning about the spirit world. 1 Timothy 4.1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, then the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. That's what happened to a lot of us. We didn't know. We didn't know there were deceiving spirits. But the church today, a lot of it, what's calling itself the, the, the church, is telling people to go into contemplative prayer, to be still, and, and know that I am God. They're using Psalm 46.10 as the, as the introduction to then listening quietly to see what God would tell them, but with no warnings about testing the spirits. When I was in the New Age, I went to an Edgar Cayce conference. We used to do our daily meditation, and it would start off with Psalm 46.10. Be still and know that I am God. And I find it really interesting that, that so many in the contemplative prayer movement are using this be still, you know, come on, and then with no warnings about testing the spirits, because it interfaces with exactly what we did in the New Age. I don't know, you know, the, the song by Keith Green about Satan's boast, I mean, I've read a lot of books by emerging church authors. I have yet to see anything about the devil or about deception. And I know that the argument, you know, people go, well, you know, you can't overdo that, you know, you got to balance it out. That's what we were always told. And I think that's true, but it oftentimes becomes just the opposite, which is a way of kind of shutting you up and not doing it. Now, pastor, you know, can you just, you know, you're getting a little bit heavy on that stuff. Now watch it, you know, who, who's been talking to you lately? There's all these subtle influences that can come in. I remember uh, as a brand new Christian, I was down in Redondo, Redondo Beach and it was a Christian bookstore, and I was just looking around, and this man was picking up his wife who worked in the store, and I started talking to him. And he said, where are you from? And I said, I'm from Chico. He says, oh, I used to live there. I said, oh, what did you do there? 
He said, I was the pastor of the Nazarene Church. I said, really? I said, uh, where are you pastoring down here? He says, I'm not. I said, well, what happened? He said, well, he says, I had a lot of pressure to not preach the gospel in my church. And he said, I wasn't about to compromise. I said, so, so this was throughout your whole denomination? He says, I was feeling a lot of pressure to compromise. I said, so what are you doing now? He says, I work in a factory. And I said, well, what about all that background that you had? He said, well, we've got one heck of a Bible study. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if I don't say anything else today, I want to encourage you guys, be careful, you know, because there's a lot of pressure to keep your numbers up. There's a lot of pressure to, uh, to not be negative. That's like the, the big thing out in the world right now is being positive. Positive, encouraging, Caleb, is that what it is? You know, it's like everything, it's kind of like Robert Schuller has infiltrated, you know, the Christian marketplace. And, and yet, Robert Schuller's still here. It's, it's unbelievable. And I'll talk a little bit about why I say that. I don't say that, you know, lightly. Uh, Schuller's been involved with some of the very stuff that I was involved with when I was in the New Age. Just a little bit about my background. I'm, I've been a career social worker. I've left my work periodically through the years to write a book, but I've returned to social work. Um, I started off as a uh, street social worker out of the Greyhound bus station in San Francisco back in the late 70s for Traveler's Aid. I worked with people that were stranded, dead-ended at the bus station. It was a great job. My only really regret is that I was not a believer at the time. Um, we were able to help people with a lot of food and lodging and encouragement and, and get people going again but I wasn't able to give them the Lord at that time because I didn't, I didn't know the Lord. I do find it interesting that the emerging church seems to think it has a handle on helping people. I very rarely hear anything about ministries like, in the past anyway, Salvation Army, uh, a lot of the homeless shelters that, you know, uh, orphanages, just all these things that have been done through the years. When I worked with homeless, I would find all sorts of Christians scattered around the community, like in Oroville where I worked, with a homeless program, I would find Christians that were running the motels doing all sorts of amazing things for the homeless, but they didn't go out and announce it. They didn't go out and make a big public proclamation that this is what we're going to do. We're going to do this big thing, and we're going to just do it for the Lord. And it's almost like trumpeting your alms in public. I mean, I just I don't find that consistent with the gospel at all. It's, it's like the emerging church, and, and, and I'm afraid the purpose driven too, it's almost like nobody's really done much until they came along. And I, you know, I'm, I'm a latecomer to the faith, even though I've been in it for almost 25 years. But I just find it interesting that there's this predominant mindset that somehow those who believe in a literal Bible, fundamentalists, you know, are being stereotyped as people that are just kind of like bringing, bringing on the end days by, it's like we all sit around just thinking, oh boy, I can't wait until Armageddon comes. That's the stereotype that's being presented out there. Brian McLaren's real good at it, and I'm afraid that you know some of the harshest criticism that's coming towards Christians today is coming from people who call themselves Christians. When my wife and I came out of the New Age, we realized we had been so involved with a false Christ, this false Christ of the New Age who's consistent. It, a lot of people think that the New Age is like all these different things. Well, there's a bottom line. And the bottom line is that we are all one because we are all God because we are all Christ. God is in everyone. And I'll be going through that a little bit more. But my wife and I realized that for a false Christ to be able to be credible in this world, he would have to have a lot of people calling themselves Christians calling him Christ. And that's what I see happening today. I see a breaking down of the gospel. I see no talk about the fact that we have a real adversary. It's almost like, hey, we're just going to go out and we're going to just change the world, make everything right, and then it's going to be all perfect for Jesus to come back. Well, that's not the way that, you know, that I read the scriptures, and I know Calvary Chapel has a history of looking at Matthew 24. There's, there's a real antichrist that's coming. And there's almost people making jokes about antichrist. Like, you know, I hear these things that are put on the internet, like, like it's almost kind of like, you know, foolish to be talking about these things. Well, Tony Jones in his recent book, The New Christians, think about that title, The New Christians. He says that uh, Matthew 24 is Jesus's quote-unquote 
harangue. Harangue. I looked it up just to make sure. Tirade. Well, you know, Matthew 24 and prophecy is how I got saved. Johanna Michelson laid it out for me at a critical time. And, you know, if you take that away, you know, then you end up with just kind of like this big discussion, this, this dialogue. Uh, another thing that Tony Jones said in his book was that uh, he, he made light of people who are into churchy things like doctrine. Churchy things like doctrine. And he said that the Bible is a member of our community and we have conversation with it. Conversation with it. Well, you know what that is? That's setting up what's going to be taking place in the very near future, which is groups coming together, so-called world leaders or religious leaders, to discuss religious teachings, to discuss and have a conversation about the Bible. And they've already laid it out in their writings to figure out what are the doctrines that we can all agree on? And what are the divisive doctrines that are going to cause exclusivity? Well, guess what? It all comes down to the cross of Calvary. Something happened on that cross that the world just doesn't want to seem to deal with. And that was what I had to come to terms with when, uh, when I got saved. Quickly, I got involved in the New Age in 1979 in Northern California when a friend convinced me to go see a psychic. And, I, and the way she convinced me was not because seeing a psychic was great, it was because I, w I really wanted to, to take her out. I, I was doing it more to ingratiate her than because I had any interest in psychics. As a matter of fact, I was a little bit nervous about it because I'm from the East Coast originally, and I had some hesitation about doing stuff like that, sort of built into your, at least it used to be built into your psyche, now it's almost the other way. It's almost like it's adventurous and people go into it. Anyway, I saw the psychic and during the psychic reading, she was telling me a lot of things about myself she had no reason to know. I mean, I hadn't talked to the, to, to the gal about it, I hadn't talked to her about it, and she was laying these things out. And I, you know, of course I wasn't aware of Acts 16, 16, that there are divining spirits. And if you'll recall that story, when the divining spirit was cast out of that soothsayer, or that, you know, Philippian psychic, she couldn't do her readings anymore. She, she lost her, you know, the, the guys that were running her business were, you know, and that's why they threw, you know, uh, Paul and Silas into, into the Philippian jail. That whole scene took place because a divining spirit was cast out of somebody. Well, I didn't know about divining spirits, and I was impressed. And then towards the end of the reading, there was like this whirling sensation over my head that was like really weird. I mean, I never had experienced anything. It's just like, what is going on? And she says to me, without my saying anything to her, she says, are you aware that there's a ball of light over your head right now? And I said, I don't know what it is, but I said, I, I can feel something up there. And she says, a ball of light. And I said, what's a ball of light doing there? She said, you have a lot of help on the other side. And I said, the other side? And she said, the spirit realm. Angels, loved ones that have passed on, spirits that are interested in your well-being. She said, but they need your permission to get involved in your life. So that night, on the flat roof of my house in this little canyon, under a starry sky, it was very romantic in terms of like my spiritual life, you know, I, was, I really thought this was going to be something, and it was. I said, you on the other side, I want to be more spiritual, I want to grow, help me. My life took off into the new age after that fairly rapidly. It was like a reverse sinner's prayer. <laughs> it's, it's exactly what it was. <laughs> and things started happening one after another. Now we hear a lot about that was meant to be. That was meant to be. And, and, and you know, I, I hear Rick Warren saying all the time, it's no accident, it's no accident. It's no accident you're reading my book, he said at the beginning of his book. Well, it, in my case, it, no, it wasn't an accident. I was suspicious because everybody was saying how great it was, and when everybody says how great something is in the Christian marketplace, usually your, your antenna should go up a little bit because usually that isn't something that merits everybody's attention. This idea that it's meant to be, meant to be by whom? We have an adversary. There's spiritual temptation. Spiritual temptation comes at all of us in different ways. Spiritual temptation is out there and it's not being talked about. But in my case, I had a number of supernatural things that happened on New Year's Eve in 1979. I was in Big Sur. I was with a girlfriend at the time. We wanted to just kind of celebrate the New Year in some kind of a sort of a spiritual way. 
And without going into a lot of the details, I ended up on a mountaintop in Big Sur, looking down on a cloud bank with two books by Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh that I had never heard of him before that day. And it was like I was convinced that Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh was reaching out to me. Well, the devil was reaching out to me through Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh, and I got really involved in his movement. I mean, as a traveler's aid social worker, just three years before, I had worked with a guy that came out of the Moonies. And when he left, I said to myself, how can anybody get involved with a charismatic spiritual leader like that? I mean, you've got to be crazy. Three years later, I was in the basement of a congregational church in San Francisco, four blocks from where I used to work at Traveler's Aid, all dressed in orange with 100 sannyasins jumping up and down, saying, who, 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 and we're doing this meditation. It can happen that fast. And I would suggest that what's happening in the purpose-driven movement and in the emerging movement is that there's a wind that's being blown to make this thing feel good. And I'm not saying that everything's wrong with what they're all doing, but I am not impressed when Pastor Rick Warren says that it helps to know that Satan is entirely predictable. That kind of goes along with what Robert Schuller said, which was, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you never have to worry about the devil. This is not exactly putting on the full armor of God. We're letting our guard down. When you, when you say it helps to know, it helps to know that Satan is entirely predictable. Can you imagine if uh, if a football coach approached a football game that way? It's, it, it's helpful, team, to know that the other team's offense is entirely predictable. So we're not going to watch any game films. We're not going to know what they're doing. We're going to be ignorant of their schemes, of their plans. I think the thing that I want to communicate today is that there is a scheme in motion. And that scheme is headed towards a false world peace. And I noticed this. I, I resigned my job at hospice in July of 2001 to write a book about, I felt led to do this. You have to be, I had a great job. You have to feel like you're really led to leave a, a job like I had. I used to do my case notes in Cayucos, Cayucos with waves crashing all around me. I was able to, to witness to people who were dying, tell them about the Lord. So I didn't leave this job. Like it's, it's not really a big thrill to go write these books. And, you, and you, you know, you, you're off the, uh, the paycheck for a while. So I really felt strongly that the Lord was saying, write a book about the coming false Christ. July of 2001, my wife and I put our house on the market. We moved to New Orleans for a year to write this book. I was doing research on all of the New Age leaders, predominantly four that I was focusing in on, Barbara Marks Hubbard, Marianne Williamson, who's been teaching A Course in Miracles on Oprah, XM Satellite Radio, daily. She's doing it today, probably being broadcast three times a day. We'll go, in, go into what the Course says. Maitreya, the Christ that's been around for years that nobody takes very seriously, but he's calling himself a postmodern savior now. It kind of goes along with some of the language in the emerging church. And uh, Neil Donald Walsh, the author of Conversations with God. Two and a half years on the New York Times bestseller list at number one, He's saying that he had a conversation with God. God spoke to him. He's saying, thus saith the Lord. And he's up there two and a half years with all these New Age teachings. So I was focusing on them in August, doing my research in 2001 when September 11th hit. I couldn't believe it. A lot of these guys are coming right on the TV, on Oprah, on Larry King. Wayne Dyer was on PBS. And they're all saying... Every problem comes bearing its own solution. Our way hasn't worked. When they're saying our way, they're sort of like American Christianity, although these guys didn't even do it. Our way hasn't worked. We need a new way. We need to wage peace. We need to come together. We need to have a, Marianne Williamson said, we need to be like a tapestry that has a tight weave. We need to have a chain links in a chain. We need to be, she gave an example of uh, September 11th on the, on the towers when I guess a whole bunch of people, a hundred people came down a stairway and they were all holding hands. It was a very dramatic, a very emotional story that made a lot of sense, you know, that these people were able to do that. But she was taking it into another analogy. And here's what it is. We need world peace based on new age principles. And those principles are simply this. Barbara Marks Hubbard had a vision in 1966. All the New Age teachers, it's consistent with what she's saying. She's saying that all 
humanity is the body of God. All of humanity is the body of Christ. Each one of us is a cell in the body of God, in the body of Christ. Atonement in the New Age is at one mint. At one mint is the recognition of the clear perception that you are God, that you are Christ, and that we're all linked through this. Now, obviously, this isn't true. Book of Acts says that you know, we, we come from an original set of parents, there's one blood, but those who are born of the flesh are flesh, born of the spirit, spirit. Marvel not that I said you must be born again from God on high. But God's not on high so much anymore as he is inside each one of us. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. New Age is preaching itself. And I think the line that really got me in Rick Warren's book, I read this line and I, I just hung my head and I went, oh no, Lord, you mean I gotta write another book? I gotta quit my job again? He said, God rules everything, is everywhere, and is in everything. Now, I know that Rick Warren would say that's not what he meant, but that's confusing. And it's also very consistent with what the New Age is saying. His book's been out for six years. I haven't seen that taken out. The fact that he introduced purpose by using Bernie Siegel, he's a New Age, he's been a longtime New Age teacher who has a spirit guide named George. Bernie Siegel is on the board of directors of a, of a Course in Miracles group. I was involved with the Course in Miracles, and I hope to get to that. But I'm just going, what is going on here? Why is he using a New Age leader to introduce purpose? Why is he saying God is in everything? Could we please be clear? And then it, it, it helps to know that Satan's entirely predictable. It's like, whatever happens to just like the pop of the gospel? I mean, just like, I mean, stand fast. You know, it's like, you know, we have an adversary. Let's make sure he doesn't creep in. It goes back to the, the uh, Keith Green song. You know, they don't believe in me anymore. Or I know when I was a brand new Christian, I was waiting to talk to a pastor. And somebody came in and uh, he was talking to the pastor and he said, yeah, we're going to give the devil an old, give him a kick in the butt. And it was like, you know, and they laughed and it was like, you know, wait a minute, this is, you know, we just came out of, <laughs> we just came out of spiritual battle. You know, it's a little bit deeper than that. You know, it's like, so we've kind of lost the, the, the moorings of what's really going on. I don't think the devil is just going to stand by and watch world peace happen unless he's behind it. Daniel said about the Antichrist, by peace he shall destroy many. He also said it would be a wonderful destruction. What is everybody saying about what's going on in these movements and, in, and with Oprah? It's wonderful. And, and yet it's very destructive. Now here's the other part to this analogy with, well, I'll, I'll, I'll give an example. At Christmas time, the White House has a Christmas tree. And it, you know, they throw the switch and the tree lights up. Remember when you were a kid, you know, like if one of those little light bulbs didn't work, what happened? Short circuited the whole tree. That's what the new age, that's what this new spirituality is saying about those who do not recognize their own divinity. If you don't recognize your own divinity, it's hateful, they say. It's, it's, and it's fearful not to believe that you and others are God. There's a real slick language. I, I wrote my book, Reinventing Jesus Christ, the New Gospel. We did a couple printings, and you know, it's online, free, reinventingjesuschrist.com. I've got updates, but it, it lays this out in much, much greater detail. But what they're saying is that those who do not go along with the divinity of man are short-circuiting the world's opportunity for peace. And who's, who are those that don't believe in their own divinity? Those awful people that believe that Revelation is really a prophecy and that there is going to be hard times. And there is going to be an Armageddon someday. But we are being made like we're bringing that on because we believe it. It's the whole, if you think it, you're creating it. So what we're going to be seeing in the near future, it's already happening, a lot of words like imagine, you're already seeing that in a lot of these workshops. I, th I think um, that word is prevalent on a lot of Christian ways right now. Imagining, envisioning, dreaming, creating. These are 
all crossover terms that mean that we're going to imagine the future that we want. The emerging church says, we have a hope-filled eschatology. Well, whoop-de-woo. You know, I mean, it's kind of like, good for you, but, you know, we've got the Bible. And, we, and, if, and if we're going to be faithful, we're going we're to say, look, yeah, it, it's not real popular to believe that this is going to happen, but I think clearly what happened, obviously, is that Jesus saw that the world was going to go down the wrong path. They were going to say that they were God, and eventually the game's going to get called on account of darkness. But it isn't those of us that thought it was, it's not those of us that thought it was going to happen that made it happen. It's the fact that they disbelieved the Bible, and by doing so, and here's the kick, Barbara Marks Hubbard, very clearly in her book, The Revelation, our crisis is a birth. They're using crises, particularly September 11th. Everything's really sped up since September 11th. They're using that to say that those who get in the way of world peace by denying their own divinity and the divinity of the rest of the world are going to have to be dealt with. And they, she actually has in her book, she's laid out, but she says that Christ told her, now we're talking about her Christ, another Christ, 2, 2 Corinthians 11, 4, another Jesus. Her Christ said that those who do not go along with this will be subject to the selection process. Now we're hearing a lot of talk about man's evolving, evolve or die, you know, you're hearing stuff like that, not only in the New Age, but also in the church. This thing's laid out. I'm going to just read you a few passages. The thing that's amazing is that in Mein Kampf, the introduction to a 1999 publication of Hitler's Mein Kampf, this Conrad Haydn describes how everything that Hitler was about to do was telegraphed in his early writings. He says, for years Mein Kampf stood as proof of the blindness and complacency of the world. For in its pages, Hitler announced long before he came to power a program of blood and terror in a self-revelation of such overwhelming frankness that few among us readers had the courage to believe it. Once again, it was demonstrated that there was no more effective method of concealment than the broadest publicity. Oprah Winfrey just finished a 10-week internet class with Eckhart Tolle, who wrote a book called The New Earth. He's a New Age teacher. And on that program, they're teaching everybody to get in touch with their Christ consciousness. Christ is within each person. Oprah Winfrey, this year, I don't know what the significance was, but she started teaching the Course in Miracles with Marianne Williamson. The Course in Miracles is teaching supposedly from Jesus, channeled through a psychologist in New York City. I was involved in it. I believed it. I did it. And that Jesus has a, it's like the Bible upside down. He says the journey to the cross is the last useless journey. Do not make the pathetic error of clinging to the old rugged cross. Am I the Christ? Oh yeah, and you are too. There's no sin, there's no devil, and basically the atonement is knowing that you don't need salvation because you never sinned. Now, that's not Shirley MacLaine running down the beach with crystals. This is heavy duty stuff. This is what we were warned about in the Bible. Now, I read an apologist recently that said, and this man is well respected in the faith for his apology books, he said, one journalist said that Oprah Winfrey has been involved in so many things, she doesn't know what she believes. Well, she started teaching the Course of Miracles back in 1992. She had Marianne Williamson on her program. I was writing The Light That Was Dark at that time, warning about A Course in Miracles, and while I was in a homeless shelter editing my book, Marianne Williamson comes on the show, and, and Oprah says, Marianne, your book is one of the best books I've ever read, and her book is A Return to Love, Reflections on the Principles of A Course in Miracles. She said, your book is one of the best books I've ever read, and I've bought a thousand copies, and I'm going to hand them out to everybody in the audience. And Marianne Williamson's book was number one within, I think, three weeks on the New York Times bestseller list, stayed there for two and a half weeks. It was really the first book in Oprah's book club. So my book comes out eight months later, you know, sitting on a, you know, I was up in Redding, California, and I saw it in a Christian bookstore, and I told my wife, I said, can you feel it? The book's just dying. It's just sitting there. It's dying on the vine. And meanwhile, Oprah's out there saying, read The Course of Miracles, do The Course of Miracles. I was on The 700 Club, interviewed by Ben Kinchlow in 1993, and we talked about The Course of Miracles, and Ben Kinchlow held The Course of Miracles. He says, Warren, I've been reading this book. He says, 
I can feel the evil in this book. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a false Christ. It's an antichrist. And the Course in Miracles Christ that's being taught by Marianne Williamson daily on Oprah and Friends FM satellite radio, same teaching, we're all one, we're all God, all is love, God is love, therefore we're God, everybody's God, everybody's Christ. So this stuff has been laid out, and this selection process, I'm just going to read you a couple passages. This is all coming from her Christ in a vision. Dearly beloved, I approach the crucifixion far more easily than I approach the selection. The crucifixion was done unto my body. The selection will be done unto yours. The decisive moment of selection has almost come. The judgment of the quick and the dead, notice the counterfeit. Have you heard that word counterfeit much lately? I heard it a lot when I came into the faith. You don't hear the word counterfeit much anymore. Has almost come. And it's about to be made. The end of this phase of evolution is nearly complete. The fundamental regression is self-centeredness. Okay, self-centeredness in the New Age is not recognizing that you're God. You're self-centered if you don't recognize that you and others are God. The fundamental regression is self-centeredness or the illusion that you are separate from God. I make war on self-centeredness. It shall surely be overcome. The child must become the adult. Human must become divine. Now listen to this. At the co-creative stage of evolution, one self-centered soul is like a lethal cancer cell in a body deadly to itself and to the whole. The surgeon dare leave no cancer in the body when he closes the wound after a delicate operation. We dare leave no self-centeredness on earth after the selection process. For when we complete the process of the transformation, all who live on will be empowered to be godlike. Maitreya says the same thing. That's what was so interesting to me. After September 11th, I, I, I told my wife, I said, these guys are all saying the same thing. It doesn't matter if you're meditating, doing TM in India, or whether you're, you know, watching Oprah. You've got the same bottom line philosophy. The big word is separation. Oneness. Oneness is everybody recognizing that they're God. Separation is when you separate yourself and don't recognize you and your uh, neighbors, you and your friends as God. So it's oneness versus separation. Now, if somebody says, hey, what are you into, oneness or separation? Well, you know, I kind of like oneness. I mean, it's like mom and apple pie. It's like, you know, who, who's going to fight that? Love and oneness. It reminds me of the Haight-Ashbury. Peace, love, and happiness. Well, I was there, like, just, I, I went out to San Francisco just several years after the hate, and it was devastation. Sounded really good. I'm sure that there's some people here that weren't there. So, this idea of separation Separation means when you don't believe in your own divinity. Listen to, listen to just a few of these. And I'm rapidly running out of time. <clears throat> Separation is Satan. When it, this, is, this is Neil Donald Walsh's God that speaks to him that was in his best-selling book. When at last you see there is no separation in God's world, that is nothing which is not God, then at last you will let go of this invention of man which you have called Satan. Did you get it? We're Satan. What did Jesus say? They called me Beelzebub, they're going to call you Beelzebub too. They're doing it. Separation is sin. Here's Maitreya. I shall drive from this earth forever the curse of hatred, the sin of separation. That's why I was concerned when Rick Warren wrote, he had 15 different Bible versions to choose from for Ephesians 4, 6 in his book. He picked the New Century version which said God rules everything, is everywhere, and is in everything. I don't know if you can appreciate that. Coming out of the New Age, you just don't read. I, I talked to a, a young pastor here earlier, and he had read the book, and I said, when you got to that, what, what did you think? He says, yeah, he says, that's, that's, you know. As a matter of fact, a friend of mine who was saved at Saddleback, yes, he was saved at Saddleback, he read that passage. He was trying to argue for Rick Warren that Rick Warren had talked about the New Age. And I said, look at this passage, Bob. He read it, and he hung his head. He said, that's pantheism. Now the interesting thing is, I'm going to have to really do this quick. The New Age came right at everybody in 1980 with a book called The Aquarian Conspiracy. The Aquarian Conspiracy basically said, we're here and we're going to make this happen. It's going to take a little while, but we're going to do it. And, we, and here's what the author said, usually at the point of crisis, someone has a great heretical idea. A powerful new insight explains the apparent contradictions. It introduces a new principle, a new perspective. 
Given the superior scope of the new idea, we might expect it to prevail rather quickly, but that almost never happens. The problem is that you can't embrace the new paradigm unless you let go of the old. If these discoveries of transformation are to become our common heritage for the first time in history, they must be widely communicated. They must become our new consensus, what everybody knows. That decade, in the 80s, we had M. Scott Peck's book, The Road Less Traveled, bestseller list for 10 years. M. Scott Peck in that book said, to put it plainly, our unconscious is God, God within us. We were part of God all the time. You've got Shirley MacLaine, and then you've got Oprah Winfrey in 1987 on a show with Marilyn Ferguson, who wrote The Aquarian Conspiracy. The conspiracy part of that title of the book comes from the uh, New Age, uh, heretical, Catholic, excommunicated Catholic priest, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. He's the father of the New Age movement. And Chardin is the very first quote in the Chicken Soup for the Soul books. The very first story is by Eric Butterworth. Eric Butterworth is the one that Oprah mentions back in 87 on the Ferguson Show. She says, Oprah says basically that Eric Butterworth taught her that Jesus didn't come to preach about his divinity, but about ours. So she mentions Butterworth back in 87 on this internet thing with Eckhart Tolle. She was asked by a woman who said, Oprah, you know, I'm trying to understand Eckhart Tolle's teachings, but it sort of conflicts with my Christianity. Can you help me? How do you reconcile that? And Oprah said, basically, if I can find it, she said, what I would recommend is that you read Eric Butterworth's book, Discover the Power Within You. That'll help you reconcile your Christian faith with what we're teaching here. Well, Butterworth talks about the divinity of man over 100 times in that book. That was 87. Then Oprah had Marianne Williamson and A Course in Miracles in 92. Oprah's been outing book after book after book. Finally, finally, she misstepped and she went a little too far and even Time Magazine this week has an article where it says that Oprah's losing a little bit of favor because some Christians particularly are waking up to the fact that Oprah, as nice as sincere as she may be, is basically, must have a brother here with this. <laughs> I mean, this is going on right in front of our noses. The title that I picked for the book that I wrote on this, Reinventing Jesus Christ, The New Gospel, the original working title was False Christ Coming, Does Anyone Care? We've kind of forgotten. I mean, I know you guys haven't forgotten it, but it's, it's, there's pressure not to preach about this stuff. It's like, you know, you can almost start preaching on this stuff and you can maybe watch people sort of slipping out the back door and saying, I think I'm going to try that church across town. I know when I was at Mike Warren's church up in uh, Grass Valley, Nevada City area, there were a couple of people in the church that said that they had walked around the community trying to find a church. And this one church that they walked into, one of the people said, oh, how quaint you're carrying a Bible. <laughs> you know, I mean, and then, oh, you go to that, you go to that Calvary Chapel, that's, that's where they teach the Bible. You know, I mean, this is what we're, we're getting, you know, my wife and I realized that for a false Christ to come, He's going to have to have a lot of people calling themselves Christians saying that he's Christ. We're getting closer and closer to that. This is happening really quickly. I realize I'm just about out of ta time. Um, I usually spend about two to three weeks preparing for a talk like this, and then I just abandon the whole thing because I always try to do it my way, and the Lord never <laughs> lets me do that. So I haven't really given my testimony, but let me just say this. We did all of our New Age stuff. We were flying high. If I could have had a show like Oprah Winfrey's, I would do exactly what she was, you know, back then, I would do exactly what she's doing today. I think that she has a zeal for God, but it's according to her, you know, own righteousness and not God's. I, I, I really do believe she's sincere. Um, I think people who are in the faith and who, who are skewing it and taking it a different direction, they have the Bible right in front of them, Oprah needs a lot of prayer. I mean, she could be a very powerful witness. And uh, I know that she's got, you know, believers around her. But when my wife and I came out, we realized that that would be true, that people calling themselves Christians would have to be saying, yes, that's Christ. And interestingly, Benjamin Cram, who's been the way shower for 
Maitreya for years. By the way, Benjamin Krem is speaking at San Francisco's Palace of Fine Arts in August. He's never gone away. He's been on Coast to Coast Radio five times. Maitreya is still here saying he's orchestrating a lot of what's going on in the church, which is interesting. And he says that he's softening the church up, which is interesting. So at, at the height of our whole journey, at the height of our whole journey, my wife suddenly had something happen. She was doing a massage, therapeutic massage business, and she had a really strange thing happen, and it, and it felt evil, except evil's not in our vocabulary. Evil does not exist in the New Age. Evil is, just, I mean, you're just seeing something that you are projecting from your own inner fears. So you always go inside yourself to fix whatever it is. You don't go to God because there's no evil. There's no framework there. So we did everything we could to deal with this situation, and, and it would periodically come back. It was associated with a man who had come in to, to the massage practice. So we were getting pretty desperate. We went to our New Age group leaders, the uh, Course in Miracles group leaders, and they had us get in a little circle and, and um, do a little healing, and they sent love and light. And I was walking out the door, and I said, uh, isn't there anything else we can do? And his wife said, put on the full armor of God and stand fast against the wiles of the devil. I went, I went, wait a minute, what are you telling? And her husband's going, now, honey, you know, it's like, you know, let's not get carried away. She used to be an evangelical Christian, and she opted for the New Age. There's a lot of people in the New Age that used to be in the church. So we went home, read, read that scripture that night, and it just kind of went, oh, that was really sweet of Julie. She was really trying to help us. She must have been in how to church background, and we dismissed it. Anyway, in the Christmas of 1983, we went down to where my wife's mom, she was my, Joy was my girlfriend at the time, where she lived in Manhattan Beach, and this presence would still manifest. And we were getting pretty desperate. And one day when my wife was off with a friend, I went to a little bookstore in Hermosa Beach called the Either Or Bookstore. And in the healing section, the New Age section, I saw a book called The Beautiful Side of Evil by Johanna Michelson. I picked the book down and I started reading it. I went like, yeah, this is just like what we've been through. And I'm reading the story. She was involved with a psychic surgeon. She had a spirit guide named Jesus. And I'm just kind of going, whoa, this is wild. And then she had a solution that was really remarkable, and I wrote it down. I was believing the scriptures that she was telling me, and I just uh, had no reason to disbelieve her at all. And as I was reading this and taking notes on the floor, because by the way, when you're in the New Age, you're too proud to buy a Christian book, because this was clearly a Christian book. I was going to take notes. I'm not going to buy that book. You know? So as I'm taking notes, this guy comes off the street, and he comes back into the bookstore. I recognized him because I've worked with a homeless. He was a homeless, mentally ill guy that was on the streets. He came back to where I was in the bookstore, and he said, are you going to buy that book? What are you doing with that book? And I just kind of like held the book to my chest, and I went, is it possible that evil is real and that it knows what I'm doing? Can they orchestrate some guy on the street to come back here? And that's exactly right. That's exactly right, because that book, the Lord used that book to save our lives. And you don't hear hardly any of that stuff these days. And there's more warfare going on now probably than there was then because we're not really contending for the faith. So the next day, I told Joy when this presence was manifesting again, it, it bothered her. It was, I could tell because her face would get kind of fuzzy. I said, let's go out in your mom's backyard. I want to try something different. Don't be scared. And addressing the presence, I said, Satan, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I command you to be gone. I forbid your presence here. I claim the blood of Jesus Christ upon us. Go to where Jesus sends you. And it was like, whoosh. It was like, yeah. It's like. Joy said, it's gone. What was that? I said, I'm not completely sure. <laughs> but it has something to do with a victory that Jesus won on the cross over evil and over Satan. I think we better start reading the Bible along with A Course in Miracles. This is how thick you are when you're in the New Age. You'd think you'd drop down to your knees and accept the Lord on the spot. It took us a little while, but we understood very quickly that the Bible was the authority. And it, it was like the morning newspaper. It laid everything out that we had just done. If you read the New Testament in light of what I just told you and what's going on in the world, there's warnings throughout, throughout. And to, to say that, you know, like, I'm a red-letter Christian, like, as if that, I mean, there's a lot of red-letter stuff, too. So we understood that there was a battle, and we would, we would go into the churches, 
And really it was the Calvaries in our area that had no problem with my testimony, but we would go into churches and, you know, one of the gals, you know, little old ladies would say, so, Mr. Smith, how'd you get saved? I said, well, you know, it's like we were in the new age and there was like those evil spirits and we called on the name of Jesus, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, you know, Romans 3. And she goes, oh, you know, the donuts are over there and the coffee's over there. And it's like, you know. <laughs> and, and, and my wife and I would go home and it was like, we're going, after 30 days in the faith, do we, do we know more about spiritual warfare than some of these churches? And that wasn't a prideful thing. It was a, it was a horrifying thing to us because we thought we would walk into the churches and we would be an encouragement. But we scared people. We became freaks. It was, you know, it was really Calvary Chapel in Oroville when we were, my wife and I were working at the homeless program that allowed us to bring the homeless to the church and, and Mike Warren just didn't have any problem with that. I mean, he, he read his Bible, he knew his Bible. And he, yeah, but you know, we, we added something to that because this is what's happening in the world. So it, it looks like time is, is done, but I just want to encourage you guys, don't, you know, if we want to go back to like Keith Green at the beginning, you know, he had an album called No Compromise. Don't compromise. Can you imagine if Keith Green were here today? I mean, I, I feel sorry for Oprah. You know, I mean, I mean, he'd have song after song after song about things that are going on today. So, you know, make sure that you incorporate some of this into your teaching. Don't be hesitant. And then, you know, there are books like Roger Oakland's book, Faith Undone, about the emerging church. Uh, my book, Deceived on Purpose, Ray Youngin's book, I mean, Johanna Michelson's book, these are, we've consolidated a lot of stuff. I just want to show you one thing as we finish. This is a book by, by Barbara Marks Hubbard, the one who says that Christ told her about the selection process. It's called Emergence, the shift from ego to essence, Emergence. The word emergence in the Alice Bailey teachings, Alice Bailey is the matriarch of the New Age, in the Alice Bailey teachings, the word emerge, emerging, and emergence are used over 1,000 times. The newsletter for Maitreya is emergence. He's emerging. I just find it really interesting that the emerging church, I think Brian McLaren said, I'm not sure if it was me or Doug Padgett that got that phrase. Well, I suggest that phrase was blown in from the spirit world. Emergence. So an encouragement to all of you just to stand fast. Um, there's nothing wrong with our expressing concern about various teachings. I think this is still a democracy. I think that some of the mockery and the ridicule that comes upon some of us when we talk about these things, I think we need to look at what's being said, not just the hyperbole and the caricatures that are being drawn. And all of you are being drawn as stereotypic hyper-fundamentalists because you happen to have the faith to believe in the Bible. Thanks a lot for having me and God bless you guys. One day, the sun is gonna rise, child One day, the morning's gonna come One day, those things that haunt your eyes, child One day, that pain will all be gone One day will not again no suffering. And one day he'll roll away the night. When the morning comes, there'll be sunshine. Yeah.
shine.